This morning we're continuing our series on Habakkuk. And Habakkuk is the man who questions God. He's the man who questions God. He lived around 2,500 years ago, not long before the Babylonians captured Jerusalem and the Jews were exiled and then Solomon's temple was destroyed. And Habakkuk is unusual as a prophet. Normally, a prophet will receive something from God and they will announce it to the nation. They will announce it to Israel, some kind of warning, um, some kind of correction, some kind of rebuke to Israel. But Habakkuk is different. Habakkuk dialogues with God. He doesn't speak to the people. His conversation is directly with God. And in chapter 1, we read a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Bruce, Bruce preached to us uh, about the wickedness of God's people. Habakkuk cries out to God, God, can you not see the wickedness of these people, this nation of Israel, and why do you put up with it? And an answer comes back from God. And it's not what Habakkuk expects, because God says, well, that's no problem, because I'm going to send in the Babylonians, and I'm going to destroy the people. And Habakkuk is taken aback. He's shocked. It's like the solution is worse than the problem. It's like, God, the roof is leaking, and then God replies, that's fine, I'm going to burn down the building. The Babylonians are coming. I was thinking about a title for this morning's sermon, and the first thought I had reading this was, things are going to get a lot worse. And then I thought, well, this is my first Sunday preaching as a pastor of Emmanuel. I don't want that as my title. And I also think it's not what God is really speaking us today through this passage. So I've entitled this morning's sermon, Waiting for the Lord to Answer. Waiting for the Lord to Answer. And it is a privilege to be speaking to you as your new bivocational pastor. Thank you very much for all the good wishes and all of the prayers over the past couple of weeks. I told our leadership last year that I would be pastor number seven, seven being the perfect number, but please don't expect me to be the perfect pastor. But I will do my best for you as God gives me grace. Okay, we're going to read Habakkuk chapter 1, starting at verse 12, because this is the passage for this morning. Why don't we all stand to honour the reading of God's word this morning? And as we read this, why don't we uh, read the verses alternately? So I will read number 12, and then you will read number 13, and I'll read 14, and you'll read 15, and so on. So the words are up there on the screen, and here we go. This is Habakkuk's second complaint. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You... You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Let's pray. Father, as we come around your word this morning, we thank you for the prophet Habakkuk. Lord, and as we read his word this morning, would you bless it to us? Would it take root and would it spring up to eternal life? 
In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Now, in verse 12, Habakkuk expresses shock at God's vehicle of judgment. You have ordained them as a judgment, and you, a rock, have established them as a reproof. Them being the Babylonians. Habakkuk is questioning God, but he's questioning God's methods. He's not questioning God's character. And that's an important distinction. Sometimes we hear questions about God, or we may have our own. Why does God allow? Why does God allow? Sometimes those questions can be genuine, like why does God allow suffering? Sometimes they can come from a spirit of humility and wanting to understand how God operates in the world. Other times, though, when people ask those kinds of questions, they're really saying, well, your God is nonsense. Your God can't be real, because if you're the things, if God is the person you say he is, he can't possibly act in that kind of way. So the motivation for the question is very important, but asking God questions is not in itself wrong. Verse 13, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the more man more righteous than he? You see, Israel is very wicked, but the Babylonians are even worse. They're idolatrous. They worship idols. They don't believe in Yahweh, the true God. They have no knowledge of him. They have no covenant with him. But God is using them to come in and execute judgment on his people. And Habakkuk can't understand it. Why would God do this? Such a terrible nation. And then in verses 14 through to 17, Habakkuk is not only a prophet, he's also a poet. He's comparing here Babylon to a fisherman. He says, uh, you make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. Um, he, that is he, Babylon, brings all of them up with, up with a hook. Babylon drags them out with his net. Babylon gathers them into his drag net. So Babylon rejoices and is glad. Therefore Babylon sacrifices to his net and makes offering to his, to his Babylon's drag net. For by them Babylon lives in luxury. His food is rich. And Babylon keeps on emptying his net and mercilessly killing the nations. So this is a kind of poetic language that he's using to describe the Babylonians and what they do. They plunder the nation like a fisherman casting a net and pulling in all the fish and taking their spoil. And why is God allowing this to happen? Habakkuk 2 and verse 1. God, what will you answer me? How will you reply to me? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look to see what he will say to me and how he will answer my complaint. Sometimes we too can question things which are happening in the world. God, why... Why COVID? God, why, why trouble at work? Why difficulty in my marriage? Why are my loved ones suffering with ill health? God, why can't I pay my rent? God, why is my mortgage going up? God, 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 why? Why, why? Why? Are you still with me, God? How are you operating? How are you working? I don't understand this. I don't follow it. And in asking our why questions of God, we need to follow the example of Habakkuk. And there are three things which Habakkuk does. Firstly, he holds on to the character of God. He holds on to the character of God. In verse 12, he, he describes God as 
from everlasting, from everlasting. God is the eternal God. He is the God who was, who is, and who is to come. Of course, Habakkuk did not know of the person of Jesus, but the New Testament describes Jesus as the same, yesterday, today, forever. That one unchanging God, the person Jesus, part of the Trinity of the Godhead. Verse 12, O rock, O rock, he describes God as a rock. He is the solid one on which he can depend because a rock does not move, a rock remains fast. When things are shifting around, the rock Christ, the cornerstone, the rock is the thing on which you can depend to stay firm and to not be moved. In verse 12, he describes God as the Holy One, the Holy One, the Holy One who is without sin, yes, but also without injustice. God is without injustice. He's perfect in all his ways. He's righteous in all his ways. And Habakkuk holds on to that. He knows that God is holy. Verse 13, pure eyes. God cannot look at evil. Why is God allowing this when he can not look at evil? We have to remember that sin is repugnant to God. He hates sin. But God is also a God of grace and he's a God of mercy. And we should all be grateful that God is a God of grace and mercy because if God were not a God of grace and mercy, I would not be standing on this platform today and the pews in front of me would be completely empty. Because none of us deserve to live. The reason we're still living and breathing is God's grace. God extends his grace to us. And in the person of Jesus, he offers us redemption, salvation, and eternal life. It's up to God to choose how and when he will punish people. God will send in the Babylonians to punish Israel, to discipline Israel. But he will also publish, punish the Babylonians. But he will do so at a time of his own choosing, which will be sometime in the future. So God hates the sin of the Babylonians, but he's prepared to put up with it for a season because he's outworking a plan in the nation of Israel and he's using the Babylonians as part of that plan. Habakkuk knows God's character. He knows the things that God has done in the past in the life of the nation of Israel and he describes that more in later chapters in this book. But he knows God's goodness, he knows God's kindness, he knows God's mercy and how God has delivered Israel in the past. Sometimes we wonder why evil prospers. We see people getting away with it and we say, God, why are they getting away with it? Why are they living lives of luxury? God, why don't you do something? But remember, it's only for now. Because there will be a judgment. One day, God will administer final justice and judgment. So Habakkuk knows the character of God. And more so, we know the character of God because it is revealed to us supremely in the person of Jesus In Jesus, we see the Father. In Jesus, we see the visible image of the invisible God. And we can hold on to the person of Jesus 
Because the person of Jesus is the character of God. That's who God is. He's not different from the Father. They are the same. An internal trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not only that, Jesus knows our weaknesses. He's up there in the heavenly places. He's at the right hand of the Father. He is interceding for us. And we can hold on to the person of Jesus in these times that don't seem to make sense, in these times when we're asking these questions. Jesus is there for us. So hold on to God's character. And then number two, hold on to your relationship with God. Habakkuk holds on to his relationship with God. He actually describes God not as the Holy One, but as my Holy One. God, you are my Holy One, personal to me. You have ordained them as judgment, but God ordains them for correction not destruction. The Babylonians come in and they exile the Jews, they send them away, but there is a remnant. They are not completely annihilated. And just as a father disciplines his children, God disciplines Israel. He doesn't totally destroy them. The remnant is part of his plan, and Jesus descends from that remnant from the house and line of David. Relationship is key. Relationship is what binds the whole of the universe together. Relationship is so essential that God himself is even a person or three people in relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as a trinity And God promises that he will never leave Israel nor forsake them in Deuteronomy. And actually Jesus, when he departs, says to his disciples, I will never leave you, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. When you're asking these why questions of God, what is your relationship with him? I have a son, his name is John, he's 22 years old now, and he is mature, well, more mature than he was. And as children grow, the relationship with their parents, with their father, in my case, changes. And when he was young, he would cry out, and he'd want food, and um, and he would ask for things as he got a bit older, and so on. But then as the relationship matures, it moves on to a different level, and we have different types of discussions now to when he was much younger. Habakkuk had a mature relationship with God. What's your relationship with God? What kind of prayers do you pray to God? What kind of thing do you say to God? And what kind of thing does he say back to you? God is big enough to handle our questions. There can be questions of curiosity. There can be questions from anguish. God, why is this happening? But we need to have a humble spirit when we come before God and a trusting heart and an open mind. And Habakkuk's question is fundamentally this. How can God use evil to accomplish good? How can God use evil to accomplish good? Well, he does. He does, throughout his salvation plan, use evil to accomplish good. Even in the fall, which is itself an act of evil, when they eat from the tree from which they must not eat, God uses that for good. Because God uses it to reveal his gracious nature to Adam and Eve and to the whole world of humanity and in the person of Jesus God unites his divine nature with the human nature and he redeems the human nature so that we can be like Jesus we can be in our character like 
God when we accept him to come and live within us. So in Adam and Eve, we don't have that state. But as Christian believers who have accepted Jesus and have the Holy Spirit living in us, we actually exceed who Adam and Eve were originally created to be because now we are united in our, uh, in our spirit with the divine nature and the divine nature is living in us. What about the crucifixion? This is the most evil act in history when an undeserving Jesus goes to the cross, the man who has committed no sin, an act of evil. But yet God uses that for the redemption of the whole world. So God does use evil to accomplish good. And even what the enemy intended for evil, God can turn for good and for his glory. As we were singing earlier Sometimes we can say, God, God, things are not going well. God, my life's not going well. It's a mess. Things are a mess. I've messed up. But, God, I know that you would not have allowed me to reach this place if the situation could not be used for my benefit. You say, God, this is painful. God, I've made mistakes. But God, I know that you can use this. This can be good pain. It doesn't need to be bad pain. It can be pain that takes me forward to something better. It can be pain that you can use for your glory and for my benefits so that I can move forward in you and I can become stronger in you. And God, you can build me back better. God was disciplining the nation of Israel through the Babylonians. And God can discipline us as well. He can do it personally. He can do it to a nation. And he can do it to a church. But God does it for a better outcome. He does it for a better outcome. And many times God does not really need to discipline us because sin has its own consequence which we have to deal with. When we do wrong, things are wrong. It causes its own hurt and its own pain, and we need God to help us and to build us back. And we are the author of our own issue. When we reap what we when we sow what we have, what we reap. When we sorry, when we reap what we've sown, we need God to build us back, and we need His grace. But whatever the circumstances, we can trust that God knows what He's doing. We can hold on to our relationship with God, which is a father-son relationship or a father-daughter relationship, and we can hold on to that. Number three, waiting on him, wait on him. Like Habakkuk, we can wait on God. We can follow Habakkuk's example by taking our situation to God. God, where are you in all of this? And notice that Habakkuk is deliberately, deliberately watching and waiting or in a modern translation, he's looking at his inbox, or his phone's on, he's got his WhatsApp open. He's waiting for God to reply. He's actively waiting. He's not passively waiting. And he's waiting for God's response. He's waiting for a breakthrough. I was at my life group on Friday evening, and we were talking about waiting and the difference between patient waiting and impatient waiting. Patient waiting versus impatient waiting. Now we had a coronation tea party planned for uh, next Saturday. 
Sadly, the police came round on Friday and they said to us, I'm afraid the centre will have to close on that Saturday. This uh, area, the centre, will be within a security cordon and nobody will be able to come in or out on foot. So sadly, we've had to cancel our coronation tea party. However, however, if you do not have a life group, the Westminster Life Group, which I'm part of, will be meeting, as it does every Friday at 7.15 in the lower hall, and we will be having our own coronation event, a social, and there'll be fancy dress, and you're encouraged to come along dressed as a king or a queen. So if you don't have a life group, do feel free to come along on Friday at 7.15 in the lower hall. We will have a few spare crowns for people who don't have their own fancy dress already waiting in their wardrobe. And we will do some social things. There'll be a quiz, I think there'll be some food, and our own Queen Esther will be leading some worship as well. Waiting patiently versus waiting impatiently. Well, waiting impatiently doesn't make anything happen faster, usually. Because when we're waiting on God, it's all about his timing. But when we wait patiently, our spirit is at rest, knowing that God will answer in his own time, in his own way. When we wait impatiently, our spirit is in turmoil, it's not at rest. But Habakkuk is waiting patiently. When God answers, he will do so in his own time. In the next section we get God's answer, and we'll look at that next week. But how long did Habakkuk have to wait? Well, we're not told. I mean, it could have been hours, it could have been weeks, months, years possibly. But however God, long God takes to reply, the timing is in his control and the timing is right because God works all things for good. He doesn't get anything wrong. He will reply in his own good time to our requests at a time that is right and to our benefit. And how does God reply to us? Well, he can whisper to our conscience he can speak through other people. He can speak through his written word. When we wait in prayer, when we read scripture, God can speak to us through it. If you're waiting on God, he will turn up. He will turn up. He will turn up at a time of his choosing, at a time that is right. And you know, if we're impatient... God may actually delay his response because we are chasing things. He may say to us, well, I'll give you that, but I'll give it you when you stop chasing it. Because when you chase something, it can become an idol. I'll give you a husband or wife, but when you stop chasing it. Because you are seeking things, you're seeking something in earthly things that can only be found in me. And it's not to your benefit for me to give you something at the wrong time if you're going to make an idol of it. If you're going to make an idol of your car or your house or whatever, it's not to my benefit to give it to you. You need to be in a different place. If you seek first my kingdom, I will give it to you because I know your needs. It's important to be connected with other Christians because the Christian life is not meant to be a solitary experience. It's meant to be a journey with others, pilgrims together, walking together, working out God's purpose in our lives, in our communities, growing together, growing more and more in Christ-likeness, reaching the lost, and seeing his kingdom come here on earth. Journey together. So if you're not connected with a life group, I'd encourage you to connect with one. There are various life groups available. There's the Westminster Life Group, Friday 7.15 in the lower hall. 
and we'd love to see you there if you don't have one. And there are other life groups available as well at different times. We seek God together. I remember going to see Pastor Peter last summer. I said, uh, Pastor Peter, I'd like to have a conversation with you. And I said to Pastor Peter, I believe that God may be calling me into a new season, into something new. And will you walk this with me? Will you help me to hear from God? And will you test what it is I think God is saying to me? This is something we need to do together. We need to walk together. We need to wait together. We need to listen together. We need to pray together. We need to do life together. Do you have people you're walking with? And if you don't, then why not get connected? This is our discipleship year, our discipleship season, when we're focusing on being disciples, but also being disciple makers. So, to conclude, we follow the example of Habakkuk in holding on to God's character in holding on to our relationship with him and in waiting on him for his response. This book teaches that sometimes in God's plan things are going to get worse before they get better. But even in the darkest times, we can know that God is in control. And we can know that it's fine to come to God with our questions. Maybe you're in a season of waiting, you're in a season of asking for something, you're waiting to hear from God, you're asking God a question, and you're waiting patiently for the reply. And if so, you're following the example of Habakkuk and what this book is teaching why was this book even written? Who was it written for? Because it's a dialogue between one man, a prophet, and God. Well, the answer is it's written for our benefit. It's written for our benefit. So we can identify with Habakkuk in his situation because the same situations can apply in our own lives. Maybe in heaven we will see Habakkuk. And he will say... Well, I lived at a bad time in history, and I hope that my story was an encouragement to you. So he takes his complaints to the Lord. God gives an answer. And Habakkuk says, why? Why send the Babylonians? I don't understand this. And then next week we'll come on and look at this um, very important verse that the just will live by faith. Because this is what this book is really all about. It's by it's about living by faith, the just living by faith, the just like Habakkuk, living by faith in whatever situation and circumstance God puts them. So let's just bow our heads and let's pray. Well, maybe this morning you're in a place of waiting. Maybe there's something you've taken to the Lord, a question you've taken or something you're seeking. And whatever that is, just offer that up to the Lord now. Lord, I thank you for the example of your prophet Habakkuk who held on to your character, who held on to his relationship with you and was patient in waiting for the answer he was seeking. And for everyone this morning, Lord, with a need, I just pray that you would give them that same sense of patient waiting. Lord, as you work out your plan in their lives. 
But wherever they are this morning, would you give them your rest? Would you give them your peace? And in due time, would you give them the answer they are seeking? I pray for all of us, Lord, that we grow more and more into the likeness of your son, Jesus. More and more like him in his character. Because all patience is indeed a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a characteristic of Jesus that he is patient. And you are patient, God. And we should be patient too. Knowing that we can put our trust in you and you will do things in your time and in your way and Lord that you are God and you are sovereign and we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus name I pray Amen